Byron cigarettes. <laughs> Statue of Byron saving, that was later in his life, he came back and supposedly saved uh, an allegorical Greece. Um, now, this poem, back to the siege of Corinth, although it contains certain supernatural elements in the context of Christian faith and redemption, they're all framed purely as fictions rather than giving some sort of allegorical depth. And I think the verse form itself, with the short lines strung together as rhymed pairs, lends a somewhat sort of humorous air to the whole thing. There's a certain tone of irony that runs through it, in my, which is typical of irony. Note, for example, this little passage um, how the use of hyperbole and forced rhyme give it a little humorous effect. Okay, I'm just going to read a little a few lines here. And this is about Acroporinth itself and its history. But could the blood before her shed, before the, the mountain, but could the blood before her shed, since first Timoleon's brother bled, or baffled Persia's despot fled, arise from out the earth which drank the stream of slaughter as it sank, that sanguine ocean would o'erflow her isthmus idly spread below? Or could the bones of all the slain who perished there be piled again? That rival pyramid would rise, more mountain-like through those clear skies, than yon tower-capped Acropolis, which seems the very clouds to kiss. So the hyperbole, right, of imagine the, the gruesomeness of the scene, if all the blood that ever been shed there could be pulled here at one time, would flood the whole isthmus, and that would essentially bring the Ionian and Aegean together. Or if all the bones of those who died here in battle would be piled up since going back to about the 5th century BC, it would be higher than the mountain itself. Some exaggeration. I imagine. Um, and they coupled with the, the rhymes like, Yon tower capped Acropolis seems the very clouds to kiss. It's very Byronic. He likes these forced and humorous rhymes when he's describing something that's so gruesome. Okay, well, just a few more things about this poem. Since it's a narrative poem that maybe not everybody here has read recently, I'm going to give you a brief synopsis, okay? So, our story begins also in Medias race. Many poets like to. Um, the night before the Turkish assault on the Venetian held Acroporn in the summer of 1715. He prefaces it with a little historical overview, which is then not very much like his poem. His poem is very imaginary, not really all like what actually happened in the battle. Um, at any rate, in the course of the poem, we learn that the protagonist, Alp, was actually a young Venetian man named Lanciotto who had wished to marry the beautiful Francesca. But before he could win permission, he was unjustly and anonymously denounced for some crime against the state back in Venice, right, by means of the post box employed for that purpose um, in front of the Doge's palace in Venice. Somebody denounced him, and in bitterness and anger, Lanciotto was, therefore, he denounces his own religion, changes his name to Alp, joins the Turkish forces fighting against his own Venetian countrymen. Al quickly has become a leader within the Turkish forces, for which his fellow soldiers envy him. So he's not really, he has no home now. He's not really Turkish, he hasn't really converted to Islam, he's not Christian, he's, he's uh, turned his back on his own religion, his own country, and is now fighting against them, but not really accepted as a part of the Turkish forces either. Meanwhile, through a rather operatic coincidence, Francesca's father, Minotti, has been named governor of Corinth and has wallowed within Acrocorinth, along with Francesca herself, the woman that Alp loves. Knowing this, Alp plans to sack the citadel, sparing only the lives of Francesca and her father, with hope then eloping with the woman he still loves. On the night before the attack, however, in the course of the poem, Francesca mysteriously appears to Alp and tells him that they can only be together if he will repent, cast off Islam and his bad ways, return to the Venetian and Christian fold. He refuses, however, saying he will somehow save her and they'll run off together the next day. However, as the battle then ensues, Alp is killed. Um, but just before he dies, Minotti, that is the father of the woman he loves, informs him that Francesca had died the day before, presumably by her own hand, so as to avoid being captured by the Turks. 
and falling into the hands of the infidels. So in case we hadn't already figured it out in the course of reading this poem, she was a ghost when she appeared to him the night before. And what she was trying to say was, you're going to die tomorrow anyway, one way or the other, but if you repent now and return to Christianity, we can be together in heaven. Now, it's presumably too late for that. Um, but to the last a renegade, as the poem tells us, Alp dies, refusing even a deathbed repentance. And in one final desperate act, then Minotti, this governor of the Vacra Corinth, sets a torch of powder stores that collect up there and blows everything sky high. Oh, there's some Venetians and Turks fighting. Well, that's from much earlier time in Tintoretto. They were fighting so many different times. That's back in the, way back in the 16th century. Um, okay, that's just a, a brief. This, this is a volcano, actually, but it's from 1812, so I thought it was appropriate at the time. Um, just so you can kind of imagine the scene. All right, so you might feel that apart from the setting, the general period in which it was written, this may not have that much to do with Hyperion's soulful musings about oneness up there on Acrocorn. But I would like to argue, and to my knowledge, nobody else has read the, the Siege of Corinth in this way, I think we can see in Byron's poem something like an ironized version of this romantic trope we've been looking at, this oneness through spiritual knowledge. This notion of immaterial oneness, after all, it didn't come in directly through Holderlin, but through many other sources, in part by a Coleridge and others. And certainly of his own generation, there are plenty of poets like Shelley and Keats who take it up in their own ways. <clears throat> what I'm suggesting then is that Byron takes this metaphor of oneness with nature, oneness with everything, of the body becoming spirit, spirit and materializes it. When the outset of the poem is traumatized, as is Holderlin's text, by this division and alienation. And Byron specifically chooses to describe the cataclysmic explosion with which the poem ends as both a reunification and a melding with nature. But for no good reason. Again, it's completely hyperbole. It's complete absurd exaggeration. It almost seems cartoon-like. Um, here are some passages from the poem. That this is him describing the explosion, right? The aftermath of the explosion on Acrocorn. The thousand shapeless things all driven, and cloud and flame athwart the heaven, by that tremendous blast, proclaim the desperate conflict o'er on that too long afflicted shore. Up to the sky like rockets go, all that mingled there below. Many a tall and goodly man scorched and shriveled to a span, when he fell to earth again like a cinder strewed the plain down the ashes shower like rain. So all these people are blown into the air, turned into ashes, and come raining back down again, such as literally raining men. Um, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The human body sheds its form, returns to the vast sea of nature. Quoting from the poem again, some fell in the gulf, which received the sprinkles, with a thousand circling wrinkles. Some fell on the shore, but far away scattered over the Isthmus lake. Christian or Muslim, which be they? Let their mothers see and say. But of course the point is that even a mother could no longer identify the body of her own son. Um, now, think back just to a moment to Hyperion's longing to melt with nature. As Hyperion puts it, often lost in the wide blue, I look up at the ether and into the holy sea, and I feel a kindred spirit open its arms to me as if the pain of solitude dissolved into the life of the divinity. Okay, so I'm suggesting here that we could read Byron's poem not quite as a parody of that sort of romantic longing to meld and blend with everything, but as an intentional ironizing of this spiritualizing of nature. By literalizing this trope, this figure, this image of one with everything, by literalizing this absurd way, almost cartoon-like way, where bodies are literally blown into pieces and melt with everything, um, he transforms an intellectual or non-spiritual sort of intuition into very physical experience. Alp, this Byronic anti-Europe, has much in common with Byron himself, including his alienation from his own country at this time. Alp says no to the spiritual, proclaiming 
that the only love he wants can be held in his hands rather than rarefied in heaven. So I'm thus suggesting we have sort of an anti-romantic, romantic Byron here again, intentionally ironizing uh, with this grotesque hyperbole and materialization, something that he knew well, a romantic trope of the world as material objects, as spiritual, he renders back material again. So, this one final idea I'd like to put out here in conclusion. It, it's not difficult in this contrast, say here, between Byron versus Hölderlin, these two romantics writing on and about Acrocorinth, but only one of them actually went there. Um, it's not difficult to see Hölderlin and Schelling as presenting a positive view. That is this view of the possibility of reconnection with nature, of reconnection with others outside of ourselves. And as Byron ultimately presenting a cynical poem um, that undermines that with this raw physicality. But let me just throw out one final idea, as I said. You know, as we contemplate this struggle between body and spirit, mind and materiality, matter and what is immaterial, however we might have described these poles that are at play here, that are under discussion, we might note that we now live in an era in which much of our experience, our own representations of the world, our experience of it, have been transformed into software. Right? We don't live in the ether or blue distances, as uh, Holderly describes, but we do live much of our lives on the cloud, whether we choose to do so or not. And recently, there's been quite a bit of theoretical discussion, exploration of notions of thingness and materiality again. And just to throw one example out there, I've been I'm reading a book recently by a woman named Jane Bennett called Vibrant Matter, Political Ecology of Things from 2010. And she writes, among other things, about what she calls thing power. But she doesn't mean something spiritualized along the lines of Schelling's dynamic view of nature, but rather draws attention to the power of things and their raw materiality. Things like plastic bags walking down the street. I will try, she writes, to give voice to a vitality intrinsic to materiality itself. Now, if we think back to Byron and body parts flying around Acro Corinth, we might just consider turning the equation of positive and negative around for a moment in our struggle between Holding and Byron. And I personally think there are a number of reasons we might want to do that. I'm just going to leave this open. But Byron, I think, you know, as he makes fun or stands on his head, this romantic trope of oneness with everything. Um, but what if, rather than doing this, making fun of, ironizing, simply cynicism, we view it as an attempt to view material bodies in their raw materiality as things that matter in themselves. Rather than seeing, standing up in Acro Corinth and looking down at the nature and seeing that landscape as the poetry of spirit, as some spirit behind it that's bringing it to life, what about if we just let it be landscape, be water and rocks, be celebrate its very thingness, its very materiality? Maybe Byron is suggesting something like that. Um, what if Holderlin's imposition of divinity, as he calls it, a spirit onto the landscape of the Red Acre Corn, is a sort of narcissistic projection? I look out, I stand at the top of Acre Corn, and I look out at the landscape, what do I see? I see myself. I see nature as a poet, like me, creating, right? Doing the very thing that I do, that I, therefore, I think is the greatest. Well, let me uh, just leave us with that thought and refer to one little, last little quotation here from our novel, Holdings of Pyrenean. The very closing lines of the novel, the last letter we have, from Hyperion sent back to Bellarmine, bring up this notion of the body and the soul again. Um, with the image of the heart. The heart here, though, interestingly, is an actual physical organ, not just as a metaphorical heart. Almost as if, perhaps, for Holderling, too, there's something about the physical body that he can't quite get rid of. OK, so here's a quotation. O oh, soul, soul, beauty of the world, you indestructible, enchanting beauty, with your eternal youth, 
You are? What then is death? And all the woe of men? Though many empty words have been uttered by the strange beings, yet all ensues from pleasure and all ends with peace. The dissonances of the world are like lovers' strife. In the midst of the quarrel is reconciliation, and all that is separated comes together again. The arteries part and return in the heart, and all is one eternal glowing life. So I thought, more soon. Thank you.